This is chapter 27, Nutritional Therapy and Assisted Feeding. Um, the objectives, you have theory objectives, identify the nurse's role related to nutritional therapy and special dietary needs, compare and contrast a full liquid and clear liquid diet, Explain the different dietary modification levels, such as puree, mechanical, altered, advanced, and regular. Describe health issues related to nutrition. List disease processes that may benefit from nutritional therapy. And then your clinical practice objectives are use therapeutic communication to assist a patient who requires a special diet and develop a patient education plan for nutritional therapy. Okay, so the goal of diet therapy is either A, we need to treat and manage the disease, or B, we need to prevent complications and restore the patient's um, health. Every patient should have a specific um, diet order. So you want to make sure um, you review the physician's order sheet to determine, you know, what that person's um, diet is and ensure that they are receiving the appropriate diet. Um, and so patients have uh, can have nutritional goals met after a thorough diet assessment has been completed. To perform uh, a diet assessment, you um, need to document the history. And so we can do that um, by a food record where the client records all foods and beverages that they ingested over several days, typically something like a week or something. Um, and um, the record is an analyzed for um, nutrient content. Um, diet recall is a 24 hour, re hour recall where all foods, liquids, and dietary supplements consumed in the last 24 hours are recalled um, either verbally or in writing. Um, it includes the time and location of the intake, the portion sizes, the preparation methods, um, whether foods were are fortified, um, a food frequency questionnaire assesses intake of foods and food groups by day, week, or month. Um, it's useful in capturing intake of nutrients that are not eaten daily. Um, review of systems, assess each body system for systems of nutrition problems related to excess or deficiency. Um, for example, constipation as a result of low fiber or um, decreased water intake. Um, after the diet history is completed, um, a nutrient content can be determined by uh, comparing the data collected with the food composition tables or using a computerized diet analysis um, programs. Also, some patients might need assistance with feeding. And so, um, you know, we'll talk about that um, as well. All right, so a lot of different patients might need assistance with feeding. You have patients that might be, have paralysis of their arms. You have patients that might have visual impairment. Um, they might have IV lines in their hands so that they um, are not able to um, properly manipulate the, 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 the silverware and the, the, uh, the plates or things like that. Um, you might have severely impaired patients or uh, patients that are really weak and cannot um, feed themselves, patients that are confused as well. And so they might need um, assistance um, with feeding as well. And so um, now patients that are um, just confused or whatnot, you might be able to you know, delegate that to your nursing assistants or things like that. But if you have these type patients, you wanna make sure you monitor their food and their fluid intake closely. Um, are they gaining or are they losing weight? You know, make sure you document how much of their meals are they eating? Are they eating 100% of their meals? Are they only eating 50% of their meals? How much of their meals are they eating? Because we want to make sure they are getting um, the nutrients that they need. Um, are they able to tolerate the diet that, um, that, they're, that they're consuming or whatnot? And so um, 
you know, do you need to recommend any diet modifications um, for this patient? So you might need to discuss that with the patient, their physician, and their dietitian if, um, if there are some issues going on uh, with the patient. All right, so surgery patients. Surgery patients, you want to make sure they're well nourished prior to surgery in order to help, um, help the healing process post-op. Um, so typically your pre-op patients, they will be NPO, meaning nothing by mouth for six to eight hours before um, the procedure. And then after the procedure, they might start off on a clear liquid diet, then go to a full liquid diet, then um, advance to a soft diet before they um, get back to um, a regular diet. The reason that these individuals are going to be NPL for at least six to eight hours before the procedure because you want to reduce the risk of vomiting while they're under any um, anesthesia. And so if they do vomit while under anesthesia, you know, that could cause aspiration. And so we don't want that. Remember, we said aspiration is when you have food or fluid going into the airway and into the lungs, possibly causing aspiration pneumonia. Now here is just a, li a, a list of um, things that can be considered clear liquid diet and full liquid diet. So if you have a patient on a clear liquid versus a full liquid um, diet, clear liquid, typically things you can see through. Um, so like apple juice, um, broth, water, of course, um, clear flavored dr drinks. Um, if you do have, now you see coffee's on there, but you don't want like cream or anything like that in it. Um, clear candy, popsicles, things like that, clear broth, things you can see through. Versus a full liquid diet, full liquid diet would be um, like milk, yogurt, um, vegetable juices, cream soups, things like that. Um, so um, a clear liquid diet, remember keeping in mind too, a clear liquid diet does not it's not going to meet your nutritional requirements um, for, for health and healing. Um, full liquid diets can be used to meet um, some longer term dietary needs. But like I said, you know, individuals that's just coming out of surgery, they might start out on that clear liquid diet. So make sure you understand the difference in what types of things are on a clear liquid diet versus a full liquid diet. All right, so um, liquid diet. So like we said, you know, post-op patients, they may start on a liquid diet, but we're not going to start them on that liquid diet until um, bowel sounds return. And so, you know, the bowel sounds return by auscultating. Auscultation means listening to the bowel sounds. And so you're going to listen in all four quadrants um, uh, to ensure you have adequate um, bowel sounds. And so we want to start out with a liquid diet to decrease any um, abdominal discomfort or nausea or vomit or anything like that. Make sure you check the persons before you start any um, fluids. Check their swallowing reflexes. Make sure they're swallowing um, okay and check their bowel sounds. Um, probably can encourage some ice chips four hours before they start um, their first meal as well. Okay, so anorexia nervosa is actually a mental disorder. And so these individuals, um, they are refusing to eat um, because they have uh, a fear of, of being obese, um, even though they may be extremely um, underweight. And so uh, they're not eating, so they're not taking in enough calories or nutrients. And so uh, they are likely malnourished. And so if this situation is not corrected, it can be fatal. And so basically treatment for these individuals is going to be some type of nutrition intervention, whether it be uh, tube feeding or TPN or something like that. And they're not going to need counseling as well. So uh, some type of behavioral counseling, behavioral uh, modification and things like that. So that's going to cut uh, 
require a collaboration between the patient, their family, the physician, a nurse, the dietitian, as well as some type of mental health professional um, to ensure this person gets the help that they need. Okay, bulimia is also an eating disorder, like anorexia nervosa is an eating disorder. Um, this one also, they don't want to, um, they have a fear of becoming obese. But like with anorexia, we said that the person is not eating. Also, they those individuals might be exercising excessively to, you know, ensure they don't gain weight. And whereas bulimia, these individuals um, are also trying to prevent weight gain, but they're doing it by purging. So they might um, binge eat, eat a lot, and then um, causing themselves to uh, vomit or causing themselves maybe taking laxatives to, uh, uh, you know, have excessive amounts of stools to try to prevent themselves from uh, gaining weight and things like that. And so these individuals also need some type of um, nutritional uh, counseling and support as well as um, psychological um, counseling and support as well. So, but with this bulimia, um, and so they're also going to have some um, nutritional insufficiencies as well. But with this bulimia, because these individuals are causing themselves to uh, vomit all the time. Remember, we said the gastric juices are extremely acidic. So you think about what that could be doing if I'm continuously vomiting, bringing up these acidic juices um, into the esophagus and the, um, uh, the the mouth and things like that. That can cause esophageal ulcers um, because the acid is, uh, you know. Uh, constantly coming back up into the esophagus so it can cause um, esophageal ulcers, peptic ulcers, um, a depressed gag reflex because sometimes a lot of times what they do is um, you know stick the finger to the back of the throat um, eliciting the gag reflex and so then that could over time continue to do that cause a depressed gag reflex and then so their gag reflex is not um, appropriate. Um, dental issues as well because if I'm constantly causing the acidic juices to come back up into the mouth that's going to cause um, dental issues as well and so um, nursing interventions for individuals with anorexia nervosa and bul bulimia like we said we want some type of nutritional management um, because there is going to be some nutritional deficiencies there. We need some type of behavioral modification. We need patient education, and we need to monitor them, uh, monitor progress as well. Um, okay, the basic cause of obesity is an energy imbalance that results when the number of calories taken in exceeds the number of calories used for energy. And so a re reoccurring imbalance leads to weight gain over time. So the imbalance is most commonly the result of overeating, inactivity, or possibly even, you know, both together, a combination of the two, right? And so, um, We talked about, we looked at that um, BMI, body mass index, to determine, you know, if a person is um, has a normal body mass index. And so we said those under 18.5 um, is considered, a BMI under 18.5 was underweight. A BMI of 18.5 to 24.9 was a normal weight. A BMI of 24.9 to 29.9 was overweight. And a BMI over 30 was obese, but a BMI equal to or over 40 was considered morbid obesity. And so um, you have the the the, uh, the chart in your book. I believe it was page 477 that had, that showed you, you know, how you could go in and look at the BMI. But um, there's several, a few different formulas if you wanted to calculate the BMI yourself. Um, like if you get your weight in pounds over um, the height in inches times the height 
um, times the height in inches, and then you take that and multiply that by 703, you get, you know, get your, um, your BMI that way. But, um, or you could just use that chart. And so um, your book talks about how obesity, the incidence of obesity is actually increasing in the United States. And so we need to really try to, you know, encourage our patients um, to eat healthier and try to, you know, move about, get more activity in their lives and not have a sedentary um, lifestyle. Obesity is considered the second leading cause of preventable death in the United States because um, several conditions can result as um, or, you know, a person that's obese, you know, are at risk for such as um, cardiovascular disease, strokes, kidney disease, diabetes, arthritis, um, different emotional disorders. So we need to really try to um, encourage healthy diet and increase, you know, in our activity. So pregnant women um, definitely need to make sure they, you know, have um, good nutritional health. Um, if you think you're trying to get pregnant, make sure you, you know, have nutritional health before, during, and, you know, after, you know, um, the pregnancy. Weight gain in pregnant women should be roughly two to four pounds the first trimester, and then about one pound a week um, during the second and third uh, trimesters. There's actually a couple of charts in your book on page 490. You have table 27.1 that provides recommendations for total and rate of weight gain during pregnancy um, by the uh, pre-pregnancy body mass index. So, you know, if you were underweight, you know, what should you be gaining? If you had a norm, normal weight, what should you be um, gaining? Um, if you're overweight or if you're obese, you know, what you should be gaining. So, for example, a patient that's overweight should have a total weight gain of 28 to 40 pounds um, during the pregnancy. If you're normal weight, 25 to 35 pounds. If you were overweight, based on your BMI, your um, total weight gain should be 15 to 25. And if you were obese, um, according to your BMI, then your uh, total weight gain should be 11 to 20 pounds. Um, and then also table 27.2 on that same chapter provides um, nutrient requirements for um, pregnancy and lactating women. So um, what are your nutri nutrients? Um, requirements. Um, say, for instance, an adult non-pregnant woman, three or more cups or four or more cups of, um, you talk about milk. If you're pregnant, three or more cups or five or more uh, cups. If, uh, well, I take that back. The adult non-pregnant woman was three or more cups um, of milk. The pregnant woman adult woman, three or more cups. And if you're lactating, four or more cups. Um, citrus or vitamin C, non-pregnant woman, one serving, pregnant, two servings, lactating, two to three servings. So it kind of just goes through dark green leafy vegetables. What should you have? So just take a look at that as well. So um, individuals that are well, alcohol, smoking, other drugs as well can impact your, um, can impact your nutritional status and cause nutritional deficits. Um, if you are under the influence of alcohol or drugs, you might not be eating a well-balanced diet. Also, um, it may lead to um, impaired absorption of nutrients. So for instance, individuals that um, are alcoholics or abuse alcohol, they might have um, what's called a thiamine deficiency. So they might be deficient in thiamine. And so the thiamine deficiency can um, lead to a type of dementia, Korsakoff dementia, or it could lead to um, Wernicke's um, encephalopathy. And so these individuals, um, 
uh, will need, you know, some type of um, thiamine um, supplement. Also, um, alcohol abuse increases the risk of uh, liver damage. And so um, you may have heard that um, alcohol abuse can cause um, cirrhosis of the liver. And, uh, and so basically, um, the liver is going to stop, you know, function if the person doesn't continue or if the person does continue, you know, abusing the alcohol, further damaging um, their liver. So um, if you got a person that has had a history of, you know, substance abuse, then um, they are likely going to need vitamin and mineral supplements, especially like we said, with this alcohol abuse, they'll be deficient in thiamine. And so some good food sources for thiamine might be beef uh, or dried milk or nuts or uh, oats. Uh, and so thiamine helps the body to generate energy from nutrients. And so the nurse can play a vital role in helping, you know, educate. Uh, well, as LPNs, you'll be um, reinforcing um, teaching. The nurse always provides the initial teaching, but as LPNs, you will be reinforcing teaching. So you need to know and understand what you need to be educating your patients. Also, these patients, you want to educate high calorie, high, high carbohydrate um, diets as well. Um, dietary fat restriction, if the liver function is impaired. Remember, we said one thing that the liver does, it is um, uh, secrete the uh, or produce the bile b i l e remember and bile was help was what helps to break down fat and so if the liver is not able to produce um, that bile then it can't help to break down fat so therefore you might be on um, have a dietary fat restriction. Um, uh, if you, if you are having um, issues with your liver, um, these individuals might also need fluid and electrolyte um, replacements as well. So there's several types of cardiovascular diseases you'll talk about when you get to med surge. Um, for example, we got hypertension, we've got myocardial infarction, we've got congestive heart failure. These are all types of cardiovascular diseases. So individuals with different cardiovascular diseases may um, be put on special diets that um, include a reduction in fat and a reduction in their sodium intake so that they can decrease um, the risk for atherosclerosis, which is something that's going to block the arteries. And so... Um, we talked about cholesterol um, in the previous chapter. Remember, we said that you had your um, uh, HDL and the LDL, high density lipoprotein and low density, and the HDL was the good cholesterol. So we might need to decrease the saturated fats in the diet. And so foods that might be high in saturated fats, um, our red meats, our eggs, our high fat dietary products, all those things that um, will provide that bad, um, that's considered the bad uh, saturated fats. You want to decrease those. Um, foods that you can take to help lower the cholesterol uh, might be uh, fish, poultry, low fat dairy products, um, vegetable oils, things like that. Also might need to decrease the sodium intake. One teaspoon of salt contains 2,300 milligrams of sodium. And so um, you might need to decrease that salt in your diet. And so uh, remember we said um, processed foods are high in sodium. Um, lunch meats are high in sodium. Canned foods are high in sodium. Processed foods, you know, stuff you can just put in the microwave. Those things will be high in sodium. And so you want to, you know, decrease those things. Teach your patients to read the labels. Um, your book talks about the DASH diet. 
DASH diet, D-A-S-H, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Those include um, low sodium, high fruits and vegetables, increased nuts and seeds, increased legumes, and low fat dairy products. Um, those are, you know, things that would be a part of that um, DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. All right, diabetes mellitus. So diabetes mellitus, again, you'll learn about, you know, more in depth in uh, your med search, but you got two types of diabetes. You've got type one, which is your insulin dependent diabetes. And then you've got your type two, which is your non-insulin dependent diabetes. And type one, you might also see as um, juvenile onset. And whereas type two might be considered adult onset. And so uh, individuals um, with diabetes mellitus might be um, on some type of, you know, special diet. Every diabetic is different so um, the American Diabetes Association is has not recommended um, does not recommend a diet for all diabetics but in your book on page 492 box 27.2 provides some dietary strategies for your diabetic patients you want to make sure you get the dietitian involved but let's look at these dietary strategies um, for diabetic patients individualization arrange individualized medical nutritional therapy with a registered dietitian to tailor dietary strategies and goals for the person with diabetes um, energy requirements match calories with physical activities calories may be restricted if the person is overweight variety eat a variety of foods including fresh fruits and vegetables complex hyper carbohydrates whole wheat pasta, legumes, whole grains, and brown rice, salt, limit the amount of salt added to the diet, um, unusual physical activity. Um, with type 1 diabetes mellitus, you want to increase calories to meet increased metabolic demands. Sick day plan, maintain calorie intake and insulin dosages so you don't stop your insulin or stop your um, calorie intake on your, when you're sick, you wanna maintain it. Um, the person may need to have small frequent feedings. Travel, continue to treat, continue the treatment plan regarding foods, medication, blood glucose monitoring, even when you're away from home. Eating out, plan, determine appropriate choices beforehand and modify the meals before and after the outing to ensure a balanced uh, daily intake of carbohydrates. So just keeping that in mind, you know, get the dietitian involved, you know, for these individuals because everybody will be different. All right, so diabetes mellitus continuing on here. So um, diet therapy should be planned to control carbohydrate intake, you want to maintain um, a serum glucose. That's when you check the person's blood glucose. You want to maintain it um, between 70 and um, 120 is what you want to do. A fasting blood glucose would be between 70 and 100. Fasting means they have not eaten anything for the past 10 hours. So usually you would check that first thing in the morning before they have eaten. Uh, eating anything so fasting would be 70 to 100 but typically you want to maintain for your diabetic patients maintain that serum glucose between 70 and 120. Um, patients should avoid large amounts of carbohydrates in one meal so the meal should contain 45 percent to 60 percent carbohydrates 20 to 25 percent protein and 20 to 25 percent fat now if they're overweight their calories uh, will probably be restricted and you want carbohydrates that are complex. So remember we said complex were like your breads, your pastas, your cereals, your rice, things like that. Those simple carbohydrates were things when your patient's running low um, blood sugar and you need something to get their um, blood sugar up quickly. So hypoglycemic is considered anything under 70. And so you're gonna, that's when you would use those simple carbohydrates to get them up 
you when you got to get that blood glucose level up quickly. All right, so when we talk about diabetes, we want to maintain a good um, have that patient maintain a good serum glucose level because when those glucose levels are out of control all the time continuously, it puts them at risk over a period of time. It puts them at risk for other diseases such as um, cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, kidney disease, blindness, stroke, um, all those things. So dietary counseling is essential for um, these patients. You want to educate your patient on diet. You want to educate your patient on exercise and exercising not only helps to lower the patient's weight, but exercising helps to lower the patient's blood glucose. Some patients can actually manage their diabetes on diet and exercise alone. And then others, of course, you know, require some type of medication to help, you know, keep that glucose in control. But either way, managing diet, man teaching them about exercise, keep teaching them about um, or I should say reinforcing teaching because as LPNs, you'll reinforce teaching, uh, reinforce teaching about weight control, skin care, having proper skin care, um, and infection, preventing infection, planning their meals, um, planning their meals, you know, appropriately as well. All right, so HIV patients, a lot of HIV patients might have um, a loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, and those things can interfere with their di uh, diet therapy. They might have severe diarrhea, severe weight loss, muscle wasting, things like that. So when we talk about um, their dietary therapy, it, the goal is um, replacement of fluid and electrolytes, especially if there's you know a lot of diarrhea and vomit and things like that. Um, gaining weight, replacing um, any lost muscle mass. Um, so research actually suggests that proper diet therapy might help delay full-blown AIDS. So if we can get them, you know, with a good uh, managing their diet very well, um, we could help probably delay um, them going into full-blown AIDS. Um, gastric tube feedings or TPM may also be required to help in this process. Question number one, diabetes mellitus is a disturbance of carbohydrate metabolism. Which two ethnic backgrounds are at greatest risk for developing diabetes? One, whites and African-Americans. Two, whites and Hispanics. Three, African-Americans and Hispanics. Or four, African-Americans and Asians. And so um, the answer is three, African-Americans and Hispanics. And so diabetes mellitus is increasing quite a bit in the United States. And so although all ethnic backgrounds are at risk for developing diabetes mellitus, African-Americans and Hispanics are at the greatest risk for developing the disease. Okay, question two. Bill is recently diagnosed with HIV. Both Bill and his partner, Pat, are present for the nurse's discharge teaching regarding diet. Which of the following is true regarding diet therapy in HIV patients? One, patients should be referred to a dietitian within the first year of diagnosis. Two, emphasis should be placed on carbohydrate intake. Three, patients should be encouraged to eat three full meals a day. Or four, research suggests that diet therapy can be a factor in delaying full-blown AIDS. So the answer is four. Research suggests that Diet therapy can be a factor in delaying the onset of full-blown AIDS. HIV patients should be referred to dietitians as soon as possible. An emphasis should be placed on protein intake, and meals should consist of small, frequent meals instead of three full meals. Question three. Gabrielle's patient is admitted with a diagnosis of alcohol abuse. She is assessing her patient for any nutritional deficits. Which deficiency is often present with alcohol abuse? A, niacin, two, I'm sorry, one, niacin, two, thiamine, three, potassium, or four, sodium? The answer is two, thiamine. Thiamine deficiency is often present with alcohol abuse. Uh, medical treatment often includes a diet that's high in calories and high in carbohydrates. Diets are also usually include fluid and electro 
electrolyte supplements and um, as well as vitamin and mineral supplements, especially um, thiamine. All right, so sometimes um, we might need nasogastric or enteral tube feedings um, to help provide uh, some type of nutritional support. So um, a patient might have a nasogastric tube where um, the tube is inserted through um, the nares um, into the stomach um, or a duodenal tube or uh, uh, gastrostomy tube um, that's inserted straight into the um, stomach or um, jejunostomy tube, which is in the jejunum, inserted into the jejunum. Um, and so each of these tubes can be inserted to help provide some type of nutritional support. And so um, individuals that have a tube place, no matter what type of tube it is, you always want to make sure um, you get an x-ray to ensure that it is inserted in the correct place. So, for example, if you inserted an NG tube or a nasogastric tube, um, and so the idea is that it's going into the stomach, right? But what if you accidentally inserted it into the airway? and you started a tube feeding or administered some medication through the tube or whatever, and it wasn't in the correct place, then um, now you've got uh, tube feed going into the airway or the lungs or whatnot. So you always want to make sure you get um, an x-ray um, before using that tube for the first time. Um, you can administer uh, nutrition through these two feeds. You can administer medication through these two feeds. Uh, sometimes we might need to irrigate it, uh, you know, uh, prior to to make sure that it is um, patent. NG tubes are sometimes also inserted um, for other reasons other than nutritional support, like they might be hooked up to suction or something like that um, as well. In your book on page um, 497, they provide um, how to insert, uh, show you how to insert an a, a NG tube. Um, and we will go over that in lab as well. A lot of reasons like uh, a person might need an NG tube or enteral feedings. So like I said, you know, you might insert that NG tube um, for um, suctioning. So maybe, um, for whatever reason, um, I don't know, you've got a lot of fluid build up in the, um, in the GI and you need to, you know, suction out fluid or, or whatever the reason might be. So it might be hooked up to suctioning. Um, reasons somebody might need intro um, feedings, uh, maybe they've got dysphagia, maybe they had a stroke and so now they're having dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, um, and fam and, uh, an inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and so they're not able to um, get in proper nutrition. Um, maybe um, they need to just get a, a gastric specimen or something like that. Um, and it can also be used to um, administer medications as well. So, like I said, the um, gastrostomy tube might be, um, is actually inserted um, into, directly into the stomach, and the, ju the jejunostomy tube is ex inserted into the, um, the jejunum. And so, you want to, before you um, administer, th these individuals, they could, if they're receiving this for enteral nutrition, they could be receiving um, bolus tube feedings. Um, which may be every four hours or so, or they could be receiving continuous tube feedings as well. Um, you can be administering medications through these as well um, before you give a feeding or um, give medication or whatever. You want to always make sure you check the um, 
the placement and we'll go over how to you know do that in uh in lab as well um and you want to um do that um check the placement every shift you want to um check the residual before you give a feeding and um before giving medications because if you have a large amount of residual, a residual is where you just take the syringe and pull back on, um, we'll go over that in lab as well, but you just pull back to see how much um, contents are still in the stomach. And so if I have a large amount of um, contents still remaining in the stomach, that means they're not digesting the enteral feeding that they're receiving. And so we need to, if it's a bolus feeding, we need to maybe hold that feeding for 30 minutes and come back and see if they have digested it. If they're, let the doctor know you're holding it or whatnot. If they're not, um, uh, not um, di digesting it, then we need to talk to the physician and see um, what steps we need to take. Uh, for whatever reason, why aren't they, you know, digesting these these fluids or the, the, the feeding, I should say. Question four, Sienna's patient is having difficulty swallowing. Her doctor has ordered a gastrostomy tube. Sienna explains to her patient that a gastrostomy tube is placed one through the nose into the stomach, two directly into the stomach, three directly into the intestines or four directly into the veins so the answer is two directly into the stomach a gastrostomy tube is a tube placed directly into the stomach a nasogastric tube is placed into the stomach through the nose a jejostomy tube is a tube that's placed into the intestines and an in intravenous line is placed directly into the veins Okay, so remember I said you can have a bolus tube feeding, which is an intermittent tube feeding, or you can have a continuous tube feeding, which is, you know, continuously going. And so um, if you have a continuous tube feeding, they're typically on uh, a, a pump, a feeding pump, because these patients can't tolerate large amounts of fluid at one time. And then the intermittent um, feedings, they're more, you know, Sometimes they'll give them to people um, intermittent or bolus when they're beginning or introducing um, some type of oral feeding for these individuals. And so, um, and we'll go over how to um, do these, do this in lab as well. Um, the amount of tube feeding is going to be prescribed by the physician. It'll be, you know, in your physician's order as to how much, whether it be bolus or whether it be um, continuous tube feeding. Okay, question five. As a nurse, when taking care of a patient with a nasogastric tube, you should remember all of the following except one, that tube placement should be checked at least every shift before every and before every feeding. Two, to if elevate the head of the bed 15 degrees before feedings and leave it up for 30 to 60 minutes after the feeding. Three, that the amount of tube feeding is prescribed by the physician or four, to record and take an output. So um, for this one, the answer is actually going to be two. So we didn't say this, but you want to elevate the head of the bed 30 to 90 degrees before the feeding. Leave the head of the bed up for 30 to 60 minutes after the feedings. And so the reason for this is because we want to prevent aspiration. So if we're giving um, the bolus or the intermittent tube feedings, we'll leave it up for 30 to 60 minutes after the feeding. Now, if they're continuous tube feedings, then their head of the bed is always going to be elevated because we want to um, prevent any aspiration. Um, and if they're laying down, they're at risk for um, aspirating uh, the tube feed contents. Question 